Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast, and we're doing it again virtually. Um, it was to be the, it, the Society of Nuclear Medicine uh, meeting in New Orleans for 2020, but unfortunately, it's the virtual meeting. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't bring you great content, and, and this time, we're going to uh, talk to uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Zamet, who from uh, Wisconsin, and he's going to be, he's ha he had two uh, two awards, successful awards in the um, Young Investigators uh, uh, area. And he's going to talk a little bit about what they found. And, and I, I think they were particularly interesting. So perhaps I, I'll just hand it over to Matt. If you can tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and then maybe go into describing the, the, uh, the two papers you presented. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> Uh, I'm Matt Zamet. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin, and um, you know the the focus of my my work is trying to characterize the progression of Alzheimer's disease in the Down syndrome population. <clears throat> so uh, Down syndrome is uh, caused by triplication of chromosome 21, and as a population. Um, down syndrome is predisposed to getting Alzheimer's disease dementia and it's purely a genetic a genetic uh, mutation that causes this uh, do you have a question yeah I was just going to see illustrate so so what you're really saying is that the, the uh, you, they've got an extra source of production of amyloid that is that seems to be the amyloid precursor protein that seems to be the the theory behind why down syndrome. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So the, uh, the gene expressing the production of amyloid precursor protein is on chromosome 21. So, so a Down syndrome adult or individual will produce the amyloid precursor protein at one and a half times the typical rate. And this will cause you know, an overproduction of amyloid and an earlier presence of uh, Alzheimer's disease onset. So the, the title of, of my talk, uh, I can share the screen. Sure. The, all right, yes, the title of my talk was the regional associations between amyloid beta and glucose metabolism um, during the progression of Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. And this study is part of the Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium Down syndrome study. Uh, we are an NIH-funded study, and um, we are also a multi-site study. So we have multiple imaging centers across the United States and one in the United Kingdom. And in total, we have recruited about 300 adults with Down syndrome that are dedicating their time to uh, understanding the progression of the disease so we can... Uh, implement this population into some clinical trials aimed at AD uh, therapy. <clears throat> Excellent. So, so I'd like to, yeah. So, what so I'd you, like uh, to. So you did. Uh, go you ahead. Did amyloid, uh, you did it with an amyloid tracer that's um, a beta-42 tracer and a, a, a glucose uh, tracer and looked at looked at the uh, what re what regions are were affected. Yeah, so go and tell us a bit about what you found. Yeah, that, that's correct. So we used um, a carbon eleven Pittsburgh compound B to measure the A beta, and then we used uh, fluorodeoxyglucose for for regional glucose metabolism analysis. Um, and I would like to you know start by showing some. Um, some amyloid beta images here. Uh, this shows the typical spread of A beta uh, during in Down syndrome during the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And if you notice on the column on the left, we show a typical amyloid negative case, and we would call this a uh, healthy, cognitively stable adult with Down syndrome. But then in the earliest uh, stages of A beta progression, we start to notice this elevated signal in the striatum. And this is something that's, that's unique to Down syndrome and uh, other forms of, of familial Alzheimer's disease that's not expressed in late onset Alzheimer's disease. So, so right away, this is a very good indicator of 
these Alzheimer's like changes happening in Down syndrome. And we can use this to uh, track the progression and potentially use it as a, a, uh, a means of recruitment for a clinical trial in this population. Right. Well, the, the, that 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 unusual uptake. Uh, this is with with um, with PIP compound B uh, uh, tracer, but with flutamidomol, I think uh, striatal uptake is one of the indicators in their their guidelines. I think uh, uh, for, for for sporadic Alzheimer's. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And then, of course, in the later stages of Alzheimer's disease, the um, A beta pathology very closely resembles that of sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Yes. <clears throat> so I'd also like to uh, highlight one of my recent publications looking at uh, longitudinal amyloid change in the Down syndrome population. And this is using a, a relatively new uh, method of quantification of amyloid. Uh, it's 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 called the uh, amyloid load or the amyloid IQ method, and it was developed by uh, Alex Whittington and Roger Gunn at Invicro, uh, and they found that you can, uh, given a, a single PIB image or any other type of A beta PET image, you can suppress the non-specific binding of the tracer and only look at the. Uh, signal component specifically bound to a beta. And that's what I show here in the uh, images on the left. So we have this carrying capacity template, which is indicative of the amyloid specific binding and everything else gets uh, thresholded into this non-specific component. And really uh, for, for Pittsburgh compound B and other other tracers, it's it's localized to, to white matter. So we're, we're suppressing that white matter signal and only looking at the specific amyloid component. Um, and in this plot on the right, um, you know, we see the longitudinal change in this amyloid load with respect to their age. And um, the, the connected lines on this plot represent the participants in our study that have longitudinal imaging and for some of them, they've been a part of this study for 10 to 12 years, which I think is, is just incredible. Wow. And, yeah. um, you know, we can see that everybody in this, in this population is showing uh, elevated, elevated amyloid uptake within the age ranges of, of 40 to 50. Um, isn't it fantastic? They're giving up their time and, and effort, and it's a struggle for them to take part in this. Our volunteers are so important for, for these studies, aren't they? It's it's absolutely incredible, and you know the number of scans we do. We do, we do a, a sequence of MR scans. We do tau imaging, FDG. We're looking at um, fluid based biomarkers as well. So every visit, we we take a blood sample and we look at the plasma biomarkers and now we're looking at CSF biomarkers. So we'll do a lumbar puncture and extract the CSF. So we really, we really put them through a lot, but they, yeah, yeah. they don't seem to mind. They are, they're just dedicated to helping us out and um, really helping others with Down syndrome too. Do they have to go undergo cognitive testing as well? Yes, we do do cognitive testing as well. Um, and we're, we're using that as our, our, our gold standard to, to classify neurodegeneration. And we want to use the PET imaging specifically with FDG to, um, you know, validate that. Well, we want to use the, um, the neuro, uh, neuropsychological measures to validate FDG uh, in classification of neurodegeneration. Right. Yeah. So, um, what did you uh, what did your FDG teach you show? Yes. <clears throat> so, this here shows a a sample of A beta and FDG images. Um, one in a cognitively stable adult. This was a thirty eight year old female, 
and a 55-year-old female that had mild cognitive impairment or uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, as you can see, the, the cognitively stable adult has very low amyloid uptake and relatively high FDG uptake. Uh, and, as, and then um, the, the case with MCI or AD, you can see heavy amyloid burden here in the frontal cortex, right here in the striatum um, and in the uh, parietal lobe and precuneus. And then interestingly, if we look down at the FDG images, you know, we can see relatively high FDG uptake in the parietal lobe and precuneus, but then in the MCIAD case, it's it decreases quite significantly. So we are we are seeing um, some significant neurodegeneration in these regions. And then, if you if you remember earlier, uh, I mentioned that the striatal A beta really distinguishes the early stage of, of, of Alzheimer's progression and Down syndrome. Uh, however, you know, if we look at the FDG images, we actually see uh, an increase in glucose metabolism within this region. Hmm. Um, and then these images on the right are actually uh, voxel-based regressions between the amyloid and the FDG data across our, our entire cohort, which was uh, about 90, 90 participants that, that have an FDG image so far. Um, so we can see this top image shows these areas of the reduced FDG, reduced glucose metabolism, and it's localized to the parietal lobe and precuneus, um, and even the posterior cingulate. But now this bottom image shows increased FDG with respect to A beta, and, and we see that in both the, the thalamus and the striatum. And, and this is very interesting because the, you know, the striatum is uh, one of the earliest regions to show uh, A beta deposition. However, we're not seeing any type of neurodegeneration or atrophy within this region. Sure. And, and there may be a, a reason for that. Um, and I, I believe it comes down to the maturity of the amyloid plaques in this region. Uh, so, so autopsy studies have shown that the, the striatum and Down syndrome shows very high abundance of diffuse plaques and very few uh, cord or neuritic plaques, which are much more toxic. And um, they also contain more tau, right? So the, the right, right, and it seems that tau may be spared from this region as well. Right. Right. So uh, even, even in the later stages of Alzheimer's disease, we really don't see a lot of neuritic plaques within this region. Um, so you know, one, one theory as to why we're seeing this increased metabolism, it could be uh, the result of an immune response to the presence of these diffuse plaques. Um, and um, this can be seen in... Um, other cortical regions in, in late onset Alzheimer's disease during the, uh, during the earliest stages of progression, there, there's some evidence of, of an immune response causing increased FDG uptake during the earlier stages of progression before you see this uh, hypometabolism as neurodegeneration progresses. Right, right. <clears throat> so, um what what do you think of the implications of uh, of of what you what you discovered here? Well, I I believe that um, looking at FDG in the striatum is probably not going to be indicative of classifying neurodegeneration in this population. Um, however, we we are finding that you know uh, as Alzheimer's progresses. As the amyloid load becomes uh, more intense, we, we see reduced glucose metabolism in typical Alzheimer's disease regions um, like the parietal lobe, precuneus, 
And, and I think that um, FDG could um, be useful in, in classifying neurodegeneration and Down syndrome. And it could be used as a, you know, a good outcome measure in, in clinical trials. Right. Uh, well, aimed I think- at, you know, amyloid or tau therapies. Right. And, and, and there's been, people have said that we really should be doing more clinical trials in the Down syndrome population because we've got anti-amyloid, anti-tau and other, other anti-Alzheimer's uh, uh, therapies that we're trialling. And, and given that they've got a fairly predictable trajectory, we know that most the, the people are going to proceed in this direction, be able to monitor that trajectory and measure the change and measure the effectiveness of a therapy understanding how they appear in in down syndrome is going to be important right yeah that's correct and it's it's a real shame that um you know down syndrome isn't currently included in any of these trials um is specifically i mean uh it, it takes all the guesswork out of clinical trial recruitment because we know everybody with down syndrome is going to get alzheimer's disease that's that's a given we know that the average age of dementia onset is about 55 years old, and we know that amyloid positivity usually is reached in the late 30s, early 40s. So it's almost easy to predict when these Alzheimer's-like changes are occurring. And in terms of other clinical trials, you don't have to guess as to who may or may not be at risk for AD in your population. You just know with yeah. Down syndrome right away. Yeah. But also, you know, there, there's there's also a moral obligation to this. I mean, everybody with, with Down syndrome is going to get Alzheimer's disease. We need to treat that and we need to include them in the clinical trials. Absolutely. And and as I say um, to, uh, uh, to, to when I'm dealing with elderly volunteers for, for the trials we do here in Melbourne, um, um, I say there's things you're being a great help because there's things that you can do that young people are just no good at. <laughs> and and it gives it gives them a reason. It shows that they can do they can contribute. I think people want to contribute. I think people with Down syndrome want to contribute and want to help. And I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the uh, the the, the, um, the benefit we're giving to people by having them fit what they are contributing towards science in treating the disease. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Um, uh, is there anything more you'd like to say about this paper or would you like to get on to the next one? Um, I think I'm content with this. Yeah, we can, we can move on to the, um, to the next one. Yeah. yeah. And I, I must apologize. I didn't prepare anything, uh, no slides for, right. for this second talk. That's all right. <laughs> Well, perhaps uh, just stop sharing. We can just have a chat about what you did. Of course. So All tell right. Us. Yes. So while the first talk focused on looking at A-beta and glucose metabolism, the, the second talk looked at A-beta and um, regional tau spread in Down syndrome. Oh. Right. And tau imaging is has really not been performed in, in the Down syndrome population. So we don't know, we don't know too much about the, the localization or the, the rate of tau spread as Alzheimer's progresses. We, we're not confident that it's similar to sporadic AD. We don't know the time course. We don't know the age at onset. So what tracer did you use for tau? So we used Flortausapir. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, at, at the time, at the time we um, we started the study, it was it was the only tracer that we had approved across multiple sites. Yes. Um. But uh, other other studies at the University of Wisconsin use uh, MK sixty two forty. Yep. And we also have approval for the Roche compound as well. Right. GDP one. Yeah. <clears throat> Right. So yes, we're we're looking at at Flortausapir, um, and uh, before before the COVID nineteen pandemic struck, we had begun our uh, 
our, our follow-up tau scan um, yes. after three years. So <laughs> we, oh, we first started God. imaging, we first started imaging tau in this population about three years ago. And right as we're, we're collecting our, our next time point, we had to stop everything. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I mean, th well, it's terrible for all sorts of reasons. If you try to do a therapy trial in one arm of the trial, either arm of the trial, people die from COVID, then then it's very hard for that trial to to, to get good data or to show that the, the, that uh, the, the COVID was the real cause of death or the therapy was the cause of death. I mean, this is throwing a lot of these studies into, into it. And, of course, elderly people, people with pre-existing conditions like Downs and so on, um, are more at risk. So so you're also, right. you're also uh, running into problems there. That's why we're very eager to get rid of the, the COVID in Australia altogether. To, to get to zero and keep it at zero so that we can continue doing that sort of work. And hopefully that will be very soon. Um, we've got it in right. um, <clears throat> we've got it in five of the six states of Australia, virtually zero. So, so if we can get it to zero, then that will help with our research here. And let's hope we, you can get it to zero in the US sometime. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully sometime. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, yes. so what did so you show? This, yes. Did you um, so yes, the second abstract. Um, really, we were we were comparing um, amyloid and tau status across cognitively stable Down syndrome adults and those that we have classified having mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. So we were we were looking at the um, for the tau imaging the the conventional Brock staging um, observed in sporadic AD, and we were trying to see if that model holds up in the Down syndrome population as well. Yes. And, and you know, from, from my observations, I see, I see no difference um, in the uptake between, between a Down syndrome adult and, and somebody with, with late onset Alzheimer's disease. Including that uh, striatum, uh, no, no tau in the striatum area, right? Well, uh, so there's, there's a, a challenge with that. The, the flortausipir compound has off-target binding in the basal ganglia, so, so that signal will be interfering with any type of, of striatal analysis we wish to pursue. Right. Uh, if, if we were using a different, a different radio tracer, then you know, this, this problem would be circumvented and we would have, we would have a, a, better, a better answer. You know, we'd be able to verify the histology that says that there is no, no tau progression in this, in this region. Right. But knowing that it's fairly similar to sporadic Alzheimer's disease is going to mean that they, it's going to be easier to manage, um, manage uh, 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 therapy trials in Down syndrome because you're going to get similar signals, right? One would hope that that would be the case. Yeah, that's correct. And it's the same thing with, with amyloid as well. You know, aside from the striatum, we don't see, we don't see much difference. Um, and, and even though... Going going back to amyloid, even though there's this overproduction of amyloid, the 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 rate, the yearly rate of increase is is the same across the different populations. So, you know, even though there's an overproduction, we still see about a three to four percent increase in amyloid per year. Well, a lot of the therapy trials are, are moving towards uh, asymptomatic uh, early uh, disease where you've got amyloid pathology, but no. Alzheimer's disease. So part of that is to perhaps they might be looking at people who've got amyloid, but no tau, right? So so it's important that, right. that both both of those uh, those traces work in 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 the Down syndrome population if you're going to be using those for therapeutic trials. That's Correct. Yeah. I, I, right. Right. Especially you know if we can, I think the earlier that we can catch um, these these changes, the better. And then, you know, that's where, that's where the striatal amyloid comes into play. You know, that's, that's going to be the earliest in, in vivo measure um, with, with PET imaging that we can see and we can um, get them into a clinical trial right away. Right. And I, I guess... Try, try and treat before, before we start to see widespread tau. Right. And maybe if you want to go really early, try to treat before you even see amyloid. And it's hard to do that in a conventional population but it may be possible to do that in a Down syndrome population. Mm, correct, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. If you start, if you start the treatment around age, you know, 30 or 35, maybe. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of potential there. Excellent. Anything else you'd like to add uh, in terms of what we've talked about? Um, nothing, nothing in particular. Um, the, the, the results of my other abstract showed that, you know, yes, the, the, the tau spread was capable of distinguishing, you know, cognitively stable to mild cognitive impairment adults, just like, just like sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So, so things are looking up, you know, we're really, we're really looking forward to, to gearing this population for clinical trials. And it's, <laughs> Well, they, they deserve all the care and um, attention we can give them, and 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 we will, and and uh, and also that uh, they can they, they can help the wider community by um, uh, by taking part in trials, and uh, I think that's a great thing to do. And the, uh, uh, unlike dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, Down syndrome is is uh, relatively common everywhere, so it's not yes. it's, not, it's not as though um, uh, will have difficulty recruiting people into that co- into that cohort, right? Right. At least in the United States, uh, Down syndrome affects roughly one in eight hundred uh, births. So, you know, it's it's a very widely available population. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, all right. Thank you very much for taking part in the podcast and and under difficult circumstances. And, uh, well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, a, a very interesting uh, two papers, and and I think uh, probably with uh, with important report because if we're going to be uh, tackling this terrible disease, then and 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 dealing with a, a vulnerable portion of our population, then then uh, then uh, research like this is going to be particularly valuable. Of course, it benefits everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking part and, and uh, good luck uh, uh, getting your research back up and running again in a safe manner. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>